miss about. Welcome everyone to the next episode of Naked Truth. Thanks so much for tuning in tonight. It's a, a really important topic, I fear, one that's quite dear to my heart. Having a three-legged doggy, I kind of worry a bit more about inflammation and silent pain and things like that. So in a moment, we're going to be talking to Yasmin. Yes? Yes, sorry, yeah, I was like, yeah. <laughs> no, I forgot to ask you that. <laughs> Yasmin, about this topic. Um, but before we do, I just want to remind everyone, in case you haven't seen it, we're doing a win a year's supply of naked dog food over on our Instagram. So if you want a chance to win a year's supply of naked dog food for your dog, then head over there and, uh, you know, you're following and you're sharing and, and really doing what it says in the Instagram post. So give yourself a chance of um, being in that drawer on our Instagram. It's very exciting for the new year best time to win it really isn't it and then you've got a whole year's worth and um, what we're not going to do of course is send it all in one go because we're not <laughs> to have such a large freezer that you put it all in one go <laughs> so anyway so tonight yeah um the topic of inflammation and silent pain in our dogs i mean i am a big fan of dr sue armstrong who has written a whole book about inflammation. Um, I think she did a lot of work um, in the natural dog care field, um, holistic uh, veterinary field, and uh, as a result uh, really wanted to share her knowledge in terms of how we are missing a trick with inflammation and, and you know noticing silent pain in our dogs. So that's a really good book to look up if you are inspired by today's talk with Yasmin. So Yasmin, I actually was reading today that in America, one in four dogs is known to have osteoarthritis. I mean, this was a stat from 2015. So, I mean, you know, a few years ago, and, you know, probably says a lot about the uh, dog food industry over there. <laughs> well. But, uh, you know, that is a high stat, one in four dogs. Mm -hmm. Is this like, you know, does that surprise you? um i'd say it's probably actually worse than that um to be honest yeah um if you look at um say the 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 current statistic of um dogs over the age of eight is 80 percent eight zero percent of dogs over the age of eight um have arthritis if we look at how many dogs um have uh, musculoskeletal issues such as you know look saying patella is one of the most common orthopedic issues that um a vet will see in clinic it's one of my most common hip dysplasia elbow dysplasia cruciate um disease or injury you're pretty much guaranteed arthritis secondary to that condition so it, yeah it's really high is arthritis and it doesn't get uh, talked about enough I mean obviously there's a fantastic group um canine arthritis management who are working hard to you know get the word out there to get people looking at their dogs differently and finding those more subtle signs of pain and again that's something that I'm extremely passionate about is silent pain with dogs and helping owners to look at their dogs in a different way and understand their behaviors a little bit better so talk to us about pooch therapies. How did that all come about? <laughs> so um, I started, um, initially I left my uh, job in, uh, in a bank and I set up as a dog walker. You know, the corporate life wasn't for me. I knew I wanted to be around animals. It was when my beagle Snoopy was starting to get a little bit older. I wanted to do something different. So I trained in uh, Marisha Massage. Um, so that is a combination of Swedish and sports massage responding to behavioural cues. So the dog very much sets the pace of the session. Um, and then kind of when I was in the middle of that qualification, um, you get up into this whole world of holistic thinking for your dog, you know, raw food and herbal stuff. And, you know, there's, there's, there's so much. Um, so, yeah, I kind of just fell into it. And then now I'm running Yorkshire Peaches Therapies. And 
absolutely loving it and loving helping dogs um live you know more comfortable lives like one of my uh, kind of phrases is be your dog's champion um so be that advocate for your dog notice the signs of pain and do something about it um so it's not just about you know the sessions at home uh, sorry not the sessions in clinic it's very much what you're doing at home lifestyle management what you're feeding your dog what supplements are you giving them as well Hmm. And one of the things that I've thought for a while is that the types of flooring might be affecting our dogs more than we maybe realise. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's more, you know, popular to have wooden or tiled or lino floors. And I think even if your dog doesn't have arthritis at the moment, you know, how many times is your dog, you know, doing it's like Scooby Doo, you know, when they run on the spot and then they get going. <laughs> that's your dog isn't able to get any any traction you know and if they're flying around a corner you'll have seen your dog you know skid and it's a bang of an elbow here or a slip on the bum there and it's those constant micro traumas that are eventually gonna you know lead to some muscle damage or um disruption in the joint for example you know think about you know how many people's dogs run to the door when someone knocks and if they're scooby-dooing on the wooden floor you're just increasing the chance of injury tenfold. So one of kind of like the most easiest um, uh, home management techniques is just put a rug down, get a rubber runner underneath it so the rug doesn't gather up as easy. Just give your dog that little bit of traction to reduce those little slips and trips that they can have. Yeah, absolutely. I think having the rubber underneath is key really, isn't it? Otherwise yeah. the dog's just going to go with the dog. <laughs> It's so easily done as well. And I guess when they're playing as well, when they're out on walks, and I know there's debate over this, but the whole like throwing things for your dog to go and retrieve. I mean, obviously this is like a key thing we do with dogs, but I'm guessing there should be some kind of guidelines around doing this for, to, to prevent micro injuries as you described them. Yeah, definitely. Um, kind of if you if you talk about ball flingers with me, it's a little bit like a, a red rag to a bull because it's ball. I understand why people think that they need them on a dog walk. You know, it's like right, I'm gonna go with Rover to the park, and I've oh, I've only got twenty minutes. Let's lob this ball twenty times, and actually, you're not exercising your dog. You're taking to the point of exhaustion and beyond. As soon as that tongue lolls out of the mouth they're exhausted you know um and if the sides of the tongue go up they're you know really exhausted it, mm -hmm. you, you need to stop you need to put the ball flinger down and it's not just that you you're creating an athlete but you're creating an athlete on top of potential injuries so every time that you know we step or say your dog steps um concussive force goes into the joint it'll go into the pore a little bit and it'll go to the nearest point of weakness if you've got typical spaniel chasing a ball like crazy they're most weakest in their elbow so that concussive energy goes into the elbow disperse into the elbow disperse into the elbow disperse with every step um you know look at the ground how hard is the ground are you doing this on tarmac are you doing this on a field what's that field like is the field wet are they slipping are the legs going out there's just so much room for injury and there's so much more that you can do on a walk then taking them to the point of exhaustion. Be present with your dog, let them have a sniff around. Yes, they can run around, but can they be on the lead for 10 minutes before they get to that point? Allow the, the body to wake up, you know, prepare the muscles for more exercise. You know, with a spaniel, they're happy sniffing, you know, weaving about and running around. They don't have to be chasing a ball. If you, there was a fantastic study done, um, on Indian street dogs, you know, what do dogs do? If we're not there influencing their behavior, what do they do? Nothing, they sleep, they sleep and they rest a lot. You know, the only time they're actively running or chasing is, you know, obviously if they're running away from something or they're trying to catch, you know, their dinner, but our dogs are in a position where they don't have to catch their dinner, it's presented to them. So they don't have to be running around like crazy all the time. We need to make sure that we're allowing the body time to rest, and repair before then they go on to do further exercise. That's really interesting because you wouldn't have thought that, that they don't need so many fun and games and so much playtime. But it does make sense when you consider how 
misunderstanding we often are of how much sleep a dog needs. Yeah. That's something I was talking to a behaviour specialist about today, actually, about puppies in sleep. But I mean, even adult dogs, it's said that they need a lot more sleep than we would ever sort of give them credit oh, for. Yeah. The default is to just presume they need about the same as us, but you know, <laughs> they need way more than that. <laughs> I think in, um, especially, you know, with everyone being at home a lot more, I mean, even I didn't appreciate fully, I mean, I knew they needed a lot of sleep, but being around them all the time, you know, if I was out working, I'd be like, oh, I wonder what they're doing. Nothing. They're sleeping. That's what they do for the majority of the day. I have three dogs, Lily, Rodney and Peggy. They'll kind of get up, they'll have a little mooch in the garden, they'll have, you know, a mad half hour. Anyone who owns a dog knows what a mad half hour is. And then they just sleep. And then they'll you know mooch around the house it's not 100 miles per hour all Mm. the time and I think um another thing I like to encourage people to do is is rest their dogs and a phrase I use a lot as well is every day doesn't have to be a Disney day so it doesn't have to be Monday let's let's go to the beach for like a three-hour walk and and then Tuesday we're gonna go to the woods and we're gonna you know spend four hours there and it's like do you know what you know Monday yeah absolutely a day on the beach fantastic Tuesday just maybe just turn it back a little bit you know a walk around the blocks okay um I think that there's kind of this misconception that if you don't walk your dog every day you're not doing what you should be doing as an owner um and that's for me I'm trying to you know unpick that a little bit that it's okay to rest with your dog it's okay to have a duvet day you don't have to have a Disney day every day um, just be present with your dogs. You can still exercise their mind without exercising their body if they're injured or recovering from anything. You know, it's just yeah, absolutely. There's so many enrichment activities. Yeah, there's really lots. good at helping dogs to emotionally ground and feel content and you know happier. Yeah, that's. I mean, it, yeah, it's worth. It's definitely worth talking about this. I think also that the rest side of things, I mean, this is where a lot of the healing happens. When I created the active foods for Naked Dog, I wanted to put in a really cool herb and we had lots of debate within the company what it was going to be. And what it ended up being was oregano, which you may or may not know, depending if you've seen them for sale. And uh, one of the reasons was because of the studies, which um, they're they're on our Facebook page, actually. If you go to the um, album of the active foods that we have, I've listed the studies that I found. And many of the studies were showing how great oregano was during rest and recovery. So when the dog finished the activity the rest and recovery side of things was kicking in and and this is when the oregano was um of its most active to use that to use the word active again yeah. <laughs> yeah so tell us what else you might use if you're sort of thinking about uh, helping a dog to reduce inflammation um and you know reduce pain i mean that sort of two different things really but mm-hmm. what are some of the things that you might if I was a client coming to you and said, you know, I, I've got a dog that is um, suffering from inflammation, um, joint issues, you know, what was would be some of the things that you would immediately say, okay, this is my protocol? Uh, the first thing is, what are you feeding your dog? That is, that is you know, that, that <laughs> okay. is the first thing. It's not just because I'm nosy. It's a little bit to do with the fact that I'm a massive raw food advocate, but actually carbohydrates are incredibly detrimental when you have um an inflammatory condition especially if we look at you know kind of the 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 worst issues that dogs are suffering from um you know obesity uh dental issues and and arthritis is one of the big ones but they're all kind of a byproduct potentially of obesity you know what are we feeding our dogs we need to make sure that we are feeding them what their body is is built to eat you know that everything from their teeth to their digestive tract says that they should be you know eating a species appropriate diet such as naked dog or you know just just raw food um so yeah that's that's my first thing is what are you eating um because there's only so much i can do um if you're not fueling your dog with um the nutrients and everything that they need the second thing is i like to talk about exercise you know you've said two walks on your form talk me through your walks you know what what do these walks look like are they off lead are they on lead have have you got another dog are they you know running around like lunatics together um 
and as well i like to kind of understand what a good day looks for that dog and what a bad day looks like for that dog um, because my idea as a therapist of what a good day looks like for a dog could be completely different to what that to what yeah. that owner thinks is is a good day for that dog or a bad day they could go oh they're, they're a little bit stiff but they're all right they're not in pain whereas to me i could look at that dog and say you're having a really bad day like that dog is in a lot of pain so it's about making sure that we understand or i understand what a good day and a bad day looks like to the owner and just maybe tweaking them and fine-tuning them a little bit to better understand the dog that's in front of them mm -hmm. now having studied t-touch i've got a little bit of an idea myself of what um or quite a bit really of what <laughs> to look for in terms of uh, silent pain but for many people you know thinking even along the lines of the dog you know I personally even believe that when a dog is persistently sniffing an area of its body, there's probably something going on because to you it appears they're sniffing, but what they're really trying to do is, is investigate why they feel something happening yeah. at that part of their body, uh, you know, and hair swells and, you know, the obvious um, differences in posture, you know, but, but to me they're obvious, but, but to other people it must be pretty tough, you know, how do you sort of, especially if you're someone who's seeing the dog day in, day out, you, you might not notice the changes, so I mean, what could people really be looking for? Um, I mean, you, first of all, you're absolutely spot on, if you're seeing that dog every day, you're not going to notice those um, subtle changes, so yeah, coat, coat changes, so that could be thinning of the coat, swirls appearing in the coat, um, even the texture of the coat can change, um, usually in patches. Um, that's why it's always important to make sure that, you know, the, the gut is as healthy as possible because that can have a, an effect on coat health, you know, it all kind of plays into one. Um, uh, arch in the back. I mean, some breeds, say for example, a whippet, they do have like a little, a little bit of an arch, but I'm talking like kind of middle of the back arch, um, that can be a sign of pain. Even things from like behavior point of view, I read um, a study where 80% of new behaviors can potentially be attributed towards pain. Yeah. And that is an absolute staggering number that these dogs are so misunderstood and they're like, oh, you know, this dog's bad. And it's like, no, they're actually uncomfortable and they're trying to tell you. Uh, things like uh, noise phobias that have just appeared out of the blue can be a sign of silent pain. Um, not wanting to engage with the household anymore, you know. Think about, you know, when your dog was younger, as soon as you come in from work, that dog's there, you've got a big tail that's wagging and communicating with you, they're happy. Whereas now they're just, you know, they're, they're in bed and, you know, they lift their head up and then they, you know, creak out of bed and they've got that tail that's hanging low. They're in pain, they're in discomfort. Um, and that's kind of one of the, the signs of chronic pain, that's your long, low level pain. Um, but it can it can be high level can chronic pain um, as well. Um, signs of pain. I've said about noise phobia. Um, well, that's an interesting one because you wouldn't like immediately go to pain if your dog suddenly had firework yes. fears or you know any kind of noise issue sensitivity. Mm -hmm. um, so that's really interesting. But you know from the point of view of you know layers and layers of what's going on for the dog you know that they don't necessarily understand of course then if they've got that layer of pain and then something else happens you know they're going to be compensating and tense in certain parts of their yeah, body definitely yeah, really interesting there was um i had a dog um come to me that was suffering from um sciatica and she she just meant the owner just mentioned it in passing she was like oh, all of a sudden he's really funny about traffic. And I was like, what do you mean funny? And she was like, well, he's, you know, he, he goes crazy. You know, if a lorry or a motorbike goes past. Mm -hmm. I was like, has he always been like that? And she was like, no, he never used to be bothered. And I was like, what could have happened? Is he, you know, say the, the pain levels were quite high one day, trundling down the road because we can't underestimate what a dog will do to please their owner. They will go out if they're in pain. They will do an activity, even if it's painful, to please the owner trundling down a lorry's come past a motorbike's come past it's made them jump everything's gone tense making that acute inflammation flare up and then they've attributed that a lorry and a motorbike has caused that pain when actually 
it was the sciatica that caused the pain, but the dog doesn't understand that, you know? Mm -hmm. So that's kind of where the, um, where the noise phobia comes from. Another one is nibbling of feet. Now I know that if you have an itchy dog, it can as well. That's why it's so important to make sure the diet's spot on. So then we can start, you know, it can eliminate that. But if it's say just one foot in particular that they're nibbling or, you know, constantly getting that, that can be a sign of pain. You know, how does your dog tell you that they've got pins and needles? How does the dog tell you that, you know, they have patchy sensation on that leg? They, they can't even comprehend it themselves. So, you know, they will try, you know, nibbling and interacting with it and messing around with it. You know, how can they tell you that they're having shooting pains every 30 seconds? They just cope. That's what dogs do. They, they cope. They don't show pain because pain is a sign of weakness. So it's about spotting all those little things. Once you start piecing together those little things, it creates this bigger picture of, actually, I've got a dog that's quite uncomfortable at the moment. And what, what can I do? <laughs> Not to make dog owners pe more paranoid than ever. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I mean, what is the danger of that? <laughs> <laughs> it's that? That level of care, but not not being a hypochondriac about yeah. your canine. Yeah. <laughs> I'm so glad you mentioned about the, the poor chewing because I am always saying that, you know, people constantly say to me, you know, must be food allergies. It's like, whoa, hold on. First of all, what are you using to walk them on? Because invariably, if they're using a collar and a lead, mm -hmm. there's tension in the shoulders. And once you can free that up, mm -hmm. the changes are phenomenal. They, they stop chewing most of the time and there, there was no allergies involved. <laughs> <laughs> people always attribute the first thing is is allergies but if you're feeding you know a species appropriate diet you know you, you you nine times out of ten you're going to be okay obviously there's those itchy dogs that raw food isn't the, the quick fix for them um it's just you know it's kind of it's like a it's like a tick list that you've kind of got to go through to try and work it out they can't talk to us you know we have to try and guess and work out and some dogs are very good at hiding pain um i find that the bull breeds tend to be very very good at hiding pain um so, somebody yeah. said to me recently now what did she have a border terrier Mm -hmm. she said to me that her border terrier was very good at hiding pain yeah. um, as a breed they're quite good and I know um I've worked with a lot of greyhounds and they tend to be as well um especially the ones that have come obviously from the uh, racing industry because yeah. you know, they're used to shutting down a bit more anyway but mm -hmm. it can be quite tough to see and you'd think with a greyhound you know with the real muscle definition as well that you'd be able to see more of what's going on but um clearly not so I tell you what, I'm going to look at questions and you're going to yep. tell us about Rodney, which is just an amazing <laughs> name for dog. <laughs> because you have a wonderful story about how you have, correct me if I'm wrong, but solved his luxating patella. Cruciate. Cruciate, cruciate patella. <laughs> I, knew, I knew I'd get one of them wrong. <laughs> his, his cruciate to be fair though, cruciates are pretty common, so it's, it's, yeah. it's a better story than the last yeah. two months. <laughs> so yeah. you tell us about this, because this is going to be of so much interest to people. So many dogs are diagnosed with this, and I think we're far too quick to go down the, the veterinary route. Of, yeah. I'm not saying don't go to the vet, but oh. you know. Come yeah, up. no, definitely. I'll, um, <laughs> so Rodney is um, my small cockapoo uh crossbreed and he was neutered at six months obviously before i knew better and um obviously when we're neutering at such a young age it can stunt growth um which can exacerbate potential genetic conditions such as luxating patella so when you have luxating patella that is where basically the kneecap pops out of the groove it's graded one to four depending on how bad it is rodney's a grade two so that's kind of middle ground and when i took him to an orthopedic specialist at a conventional vets um i you know explained that i, I think he's got um looks same patella because i was probably about halfway through my training as a massage therapist at this point and it came back that you know through palpation uh this vet said oh he's he's got a tear in his cruciate and i was like right okay you know how how bad i mean anyone who's had a dog that has had a cruciate injury or a full cruciate rupture it's if it's a full cruciate rupture surgery kind of is your only 
point of call. But with Rodney, it was only a tear to, the, to that ligament. So I said, I'd just like to go away and just see if I can mend it. And he went, I've never seen massage fix this. And I was like, yeah, I'd, ju I'd just like to try though. I'm dead stubborn. So I went away, did my research. I obviously was already raw fed at this point, but that's when I started looking at what extra bits can I add to the bowl. So beef trachea, paddy whack, green lip muscles, uh, chamomile tea, which is amazing for inflammation, uh, turmeric, ACV with ginger. You know, I added... Oof, added loads in um obviously he was having massage with me hydrotherapy led therapy cryotherapy the whole lot wow it was, it was intense and then i took him to my um i moved to a holistic vet so brendan clark at tower wood um has a wonderful acupuncturist called uh, christina so i went obviously this is been about eight months since I've been to see that vet who was adamant he should be in for surgery the next week and I was like no um took him and I said give me the honest answer I said I want to know how that cruise ship's looking and you know does it need surgery and she was like it's fine I went sorry <laughs> she was like it's fine I was like are you saying that the cruise ship is stable and she was like yeah and I was like it was ruptured but this is what I've been doing but now it's stable and she went yeah and I was like oh right okay got in the car and cried my eyes out I was like yes winning <laughs> but um it was you know he would have potentially been a candidate for surgery and now he's not and I think it, it took a lot of work the chances of that cruise ship rupturing in the future yeah we we have to be realistic there is obviously still that chance there um but if i can delay that surgery or delay that rupture or anything it's it's in rodney's in rodney's benefit what do you think is making breeds susceptible to cruciate injuries um it does seem to be certain breeds actually doesn't yeah, it yeah it's um it tends to be so your cruciate ligament is so you say you've got two bones of the leg there the cruciate's this little cross ligament in 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 between them and it stops the bones kind of moving forwards and backwards it keeps them stable and then the, the patella sits here um if you have a dog that has hip dysplasia so a lot of um breeds are prone to that um a lot of bull breeds your frenchies your english bulldogs your labradors um so hip dysplasia, luxate and patella, which tends to affect smaller dogs, but not exclusively. Chihuahuas, Yorkshire Terriers, poodles. Think about how many you know poodle crosses that we've got. Cruciate injuries tend to come secondary to that because mm -hmm. there's abnormal movement in the hip or there's ab abnormal movement in that patella. It puts additional pressure on that cruciate, which causes that tear. The, it's Imagine like a rope. And then if you've got a knife and just did that and it frays a little bit, that's mm -hmm. kind of what we're working with. So, so yeah. if you were kind of able to notice the hip side of things earlier. Yeah. Um, to, um, to notice the hip side of things earlier, I mean, if you, I know that a lot of people have bought a lot of lockdown puppies, but just make sure that um, there's um, hip scores in place, L, uh, all the health tests, um, that you can possibly have for a dog if you're going to be investing in um, a puppy. Um, make sure you've got those. Um, don't be under any illusion that, you know, crossbreed dogs are, are safer because they're not. You know, Rodney's got four different breeds in him and he has looks and patella. It's, it's, it's down to the breeding. But saying that, if you catch it early enough, there are some instances, if you allow the musculoskeletal system to mature fully, obviously they're fed correctly, um, that the, the the grading of the luxation or the hips can, you know, it can get a little bit better. You can't cure it, mm. but as long as you're, you know, not over-exercising the dog and, you know, conservatively managing it until they've matured, then you do x-rays you might find that it's not quite as bad as when they were a puppy because puppies grow wonky you know like i saw a spaniel oh. 
Yeah, no, I was um, filming, which we haven't screened yet, secret, secret information. There's going to be Sunday Puppy Club and uh, we're, we're going to be sharing all information about uh, puppies' behaviour and uh, raw feeding for puppies and, you know, when to tea to when to vaccine, all that sort of thing. So that's oh, coming wow. up soon. Yeah, that'll be but, uh, yeah, I was speaking to a lady about uh, breeding raw uh, pup fed puppies, <laughs> breeding raw puppies, <laughs> breeding raw fed puppies. And... Um, she and of course she had uh, like the mum you know generations down the line had been uh, uh, had been raw feeding and she was saying that the wonkiness didn't show up as much and it reminded me that um oh so many years ago like 25 years ago or something when we bred our Pyrenean mountain dogs and they were second generation raw fed if that's the right term so the yeah. mum and the grandparents were raw fed um and uh, they didn't grow very wonky either. And I kind of thought at the time that was a bit weird and we were just lucky. But I'm wondering if actually the balance of nutrition would really affect yeah. it. Yeah, no, I, I, I mean, definitely. I mean, who am I to say that without science behind it? <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. There's absolutely a link there. Talking of science, it's also what you're saying has triggered a memory of me in a Catherine O'Driscoll uh, natural dog care workshop where she is sharing a study and for some weird reason I've got a memory of Julie Arnold from Natural Healthy Pets being there or at least discussing this with her of the it was a high amount of vitamin C that Catherine had found a study showing that dogs given a high amount of vitamin C now high you know it obviously wasn't too high but I, I can't remember the exact one I'm gonna to have to hunt the study now um these they were given it um fairly young and they didn't the group that had it didn't show the hip dysplasia in the same way which would make sense in terms of you know thinking about other joint issues that are related to you know the collagen formation for instance yeah. you know you need vitamin c it's a pivotal role in collagen formation so yeah, I'm going to find that study. Yeah, I send it that study. I love, I love this stuff. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we'll find it. So I just want to um, say thanks to those of you also that are commenting. And Danielle, I do believe that your question was answered, I, I think, a little bit. Um, Yasmin, Danielle was asking, what can she feed um, to a dog that's got uh, joint issues? I'm just going to double check whether her dog had silent pain or whether her dog had... Um, let me just double check. Oh, so many comments now. It's great. <laughs> well, if, there's, if there's any questions that we, you know, have oh, here we are. I can jump back on them and answer them. Absolutely, absolutely. We, we, we can we can both hop on. Yeah. Um, so nutrition wise for inflammation and joint health. So I think, yeah, I mean, one of the big things is um, the way I look at it with with diet is that you feed for what you want to assist with. So, you know, if your dog's got pancreatitis, you consider could you feed pancreas to your dog? You know, is that going to support your dog with that ailment? So um, what you were saying earlier about feeding uh, cartilage so yeah. feeding trachea and to tell us again anyway so what can yeah, people no, feed fine. i call it i call it my rodney protocol so <laughs> um uh raw paddy whack um obviously be careful because it is kind of big and you know it's quite rubbery so dogs tend to go and have it whole so if you've got a dog that tends to yeah. swallow it all you know chop it up into little bits i'll give it to them like half frozen just to try and slow them down a little bit so uh, yeah, your raw, raw paddy whack, uh, bone broth. Um, bone broth, amazing. I'm so glad you've mentioned that because I probably would have forgotten. Love it. It's phenomenal. Wow, wow, yes. <laughs> and you can make your own, of course, or, you, or yes. you can purchase it. Absolutely. You can, again, it's kind of condensing down the um, the nutrients from like paddy whack and chicken feet and pig's trotters and things like that. If you can't quite stomach your dog eating those raw, bone broth is fantastic for that uh your green lip mussels obviously very important uh, fresh fish love fresh fish um as well chamomile for inflammation acv um inflammation again ginger um mm -hmm. turmeric as well these and i think all these it's in the superfoods <laughs> you've got all that reason because <laughs> um, it's important that even though I absolutely piled Rodney with loads of cartilage, it was really important that I was piling in with stuff that was there to target inflammation. Another thing, just as kind of like a word of caution as such, is I didn't add all of these in in, in one go. Kind of, well, the, 
the cartilage stuff I did, but the stuff to manage the inflammation, I kind of did one at a time just to make sure that because it's it's really easy to fall into that trap of the uh, caregiver's placebo. You have to be objective about whether or not your dog is actually seeing or feeling any of the effects of the stuff that you're feeding them. So with um, your, um, with your supporting stuff for inflammation, just go nice and steady. I always recommend people to keep a pain diary. Um, so you can kind of mark your good days and your bad days, just to see if there's any patterns um, and for you to understand better what looks like a good day for your dog and what looks like a bad day for your dog. It mm. helps me as a therapist to understand that, um, but it's also good for you guys to keep a track as well. Absolutely. God, I've got all sorts of things I've thought of. We could be here for ages. But can I just ask as well, can you, yeah. I mean, I know my, I know my opinion, but uh, what, what do you feel about the contribution of um, early neutering to, to joint health? And, and is this something we should really be thinking about? Yeah, massively so. Um, sadly, I learned the hard way with Rodney. He was neutered at, at six months and I have his sister as well. Um, who she does have um, luxating patella. However, she wasn't neutered until she was a year and a half. She's not even bad enough that she can be graded at a one, whereas Rodney's two, so it's one to four that it's graded. He's two, he's bang in the middle. Um, and Lily's not even, there's a slight movement there, um, but it's it's not enough that it can be graded. Um, my vet told me, she was like, you've only found this because you're a therapist and you've been digging around looking for stuff. Um, so I think, you know, Rodney was done at six months. He is, he's like, you know, say 50% worse. Lily still has it. Obviously, she's been predisposed due to her breeding mm -hmm. um, and she's not nearly as bad. So with, with Lily, it's about conservative management. She can still live quite a full active life. Obviously, she has therapy from me. She goes to regular hydrotherapy as well. Um, Rodney is is worse because he was neutered at six months so mm -hmm. i think you know sometimes you you have a bit of fear put into you that you're not doing the right thing as a dog owner and you're irresponsible if you don't neuter him as soon as you can when actually his body hadn't even had time to mature yes um, and so the, the hormones that they they remove through the neutering are the same ones that set uh, grow and set the, the joints aren't they so yeah, they need much longer stunting, much, much stunting longer. The growth stunting the growth plates stunting yeah. um uh, emotional and cognitive cognitive maturity as well there's so many ramifications for having your dog neutered um too early so rodney i've had to put a lot of work into trying to trying to mend the damage that's that's been done um however i i, I know for next time but um I talk, <laughs> I talk a lot to people about it i always say just if you are wanting to neuter make sure that your dog is as mature as they can be before any surgery or any joints make sure they have been allowed to grow first mm. and that is different depending on your breeds as well the, the ages will differ Yes, I think, well, to be honest, there are studies about this um, and we could end up doing a whole live just on... I know. <laughs> uh, yeah, I might, I might book somebody to talk about that because I have an idea that Junior Hudson is a little bit of a knowledge boat about all this. Isn't he? He, is it Heal Your Dog? Is that his website? He seems to have a lot of information about um, early neutering on his website. Yeah. Well, it's a fantastic lot of information and we have, of course, overrun with excitement about <laughs> sharing oh. the wonderful <laughs> ways we can support our dogs with uh, joint and inflammation um, yeah, solutions, really, aren't they? Well, next week, next week, we will be um, talking to Alison Daniel. We are going to be talking about something else that is promoted by inflammation. Um, especially recognised as that in natural natural healthcare anyway, and that's cancer. So another big topic. Not exactly started with easy topics with this <laughs> naked truth, have we? <laughs> 
So I do hope you can join us next week um, for the discussion on um, cancer in dogs with Alison from My Pet Nutritionist. And in the meantime, I'd say a big thank you to Yasmin for being with us tonight and sharing all her incredible knowledge. And just tell people um, websites or books or whatever, webinars. <laughs> um, you can find me at yorkshirepooches.co.uk. Uh, um, I'm doing online consultations if you're outside of uh, West Yorkshire. Uh, you can find me on Instagram and th there might be a book on the way. Who who knows? I've got, I've got a lot to say. <laughs> <laughs> well, you've definitely got enough dog photos. Yes. <laughs> so many photos i've got like that's for sure <laughs> thousand photos of dogs on my phone <laughs> okay brilliant thanks so much for watching guys and we will um we should be back at seven ne next week there, there shouldn't there shouldn't be uh timing issues next week at all so see you next week uh for another canine conversation as they should be <laughs>